welcome all of you guys that are with us here. Um, I'm sure we'll have quite a few people join us this evening. We have a couple hundred signed up, so that's uh, exciting. Thanks for inviting your guys' friends and sharing the word. Uh, tonight, we're going to be talking about perennial pastures. If you guys have tuned in to the first two webinars, this one's going to be a little bit different. Um, we have decided there's so many questions that come with establishing pasture that we're going to let Dale kind of take the reins on this. And I've kind of asked him a set of questions that I receive a lot. Um, and so we tried to tailor this presentation to answer a lot of those questions. Um, but we will be taking your questions in the Q&A. Uh, you can type those questions out there. And then we're going to let Dale kind of go for about 45 minutes. And if you have questions after that at around 610, 615, we're going to open it up to the audience. And um, if you want to ask your question, you can raise your hand and then I'll unmute you. Otherwise, you can just type it right in the Q&A box anytime during his presentation. So um, we are going to get started a little bit faster here this week just because we've got a lot to cover. So I'm going to introduce Dale. Um, he has his degree from Kansas State, his, his bachelor's degree and his master's in agronomy with an emphasis in rangeland, rangeland management and has been with Green Cover Seed as our agronomist and sales rep for the last five years. So with that, Dale, do you want to go ahead and kind of get started on why people should be establishing pasture? Okay. Well, um, the first thing is this is the question I get most often. It's like, what should I plant for pasture? <laughs> That's the question I, I honestly can't answer until I get some more information. And, and some of that information I ask, uh, um, for example, what's your time frame? Are you looking for pasture for this year only? In which case we'd go with an annual pasture. Or are you looking for a pasture for uh, Five years, are you looking for a pasture that's going to last forever? Because what my answer is going to be is going to be completely different depending on your answer to do you want an annual, a five-year, or a 50-year pasture? Um, and then people would say, well, why would I plant a pasture for five years? Why would I plant a pasture for four years? Um, that's actually getting to be a very popular practice because – the fastest way to rebuild the soil is by planting a pasture and grazing it. Um, if you look at these two corn plants, these two corn plants are the same hybrid, planted the same day within minutes of each other, two adjacent planter passes, um, both irrigated, both fully fertilized to soil test. Say, why is one twice the size of the other? The one on the right, was planted into a newly terminated pasture sod. The other one was planted on soybean stubble that had been farmed for 100 years. And if you think the purpose of soil is solely to provide water and nutrients, both of these plants had adequate water and adequate fertilizer. Why is the one on the right twice the size? Obviously, there's things that soil is providing. If it's good, healthy soil like you get from pasture sod, the one on the right supplying things that the one on the left is not. And, and you know, maybe it's just something as simple as organic matter. You can see from this study, the, the, the graph at the right, look at how the organic matter in the pasture soil is higher than under conservation tillage and far higher than it was under conventional tillage. And how does that affect yields? Well, this is a, a study that measured peanut yields down in Florida, and you can see that um, compared continuous peanut without any inputs and uh, very poor yields. Now, you can grow continuous peanut if you are putting on a whole bunch of chemical inputs, you know, things, fungicides, nematicides, herbicides. Um, but look at where you, the very bottom of that, the peanut cotton bahia grass pasture rotation, where two years of pasture were inserted in this crop rotation. Look at how high the yields of the peanut were without fungicide, without nematicide. And look, look at the bottom there. That's, that's the real kicker there. 
the profit was four to 27 times higher on the rotation that included the pasture. Higher yields, fewer inputs is a good good recipe for profit. And, and it took only 250 acres to raise a family with that rotation compared to 10 times as much area. What is that when you get 10 times more farmers out on the land, more farm families out on the land, what does that do for your your rural economy and your rural sociology? Maybe we wouldn't have small towns dying up. I think this is this inserting a short-term pasture into the rotation has tremendous potential, not only for rebuilding soil, but for rebuilding communities. Um, another question I ask is, are you starting from a, an existing pasture that's just you're not satisfactory? Um, you need some additional species, or are you starting from bare cropland that you're planting everything? Another thing is, when do you need grazing? Do you need more winter grazing? Do you need it in early spring? Do you need it in the heat of summer? If you're in Missouri and you got all cool season grasses, maybe you need summer grazing. You need more grazing in the fall. Um, and the, there really is no one species that provides good year round grazing, uh, especially grasses. You can see this, this picture is a picture of a clump of green fescue surrounded by Bermuda grass. And this was taken April 9th in Pratt, Kansas. You can see the fescue is a cool season grass and is growing fine, it's ready to graze. The Bermuda grass hasn't even greened up. Now, if you were to take this same picture in the same location in the middle of July, the fescue would be brown and the Bermuda grass would be green. Cool season grasses, warm season grasses are fundamentally different. They do not grow the same. They photosynthesize differently. They have different requirements. So it's, it's difficult to have one or the other that's going to provide year-round grazing. You need a sequence or a mixture of the two. And I prefer a sequence. We'll get into that a little later why I prefer a sequence over mixing warm and cool season grasses. Another thing is uh, if you are planning, and we'll focus primarily on cool season grasses in this conversation because uh, most of the orders we get are for planting cool season grasses. They're cheaper to plant and they're faster to establish. But, uh, and, and we'll save warm season grass establishment for another webinar. But um, when you uh, there, there's two basic windows for establishing cool season pastures. Uh, there's spring and there's fall. And the spring in, in the Kansas, Nebraska general area here, we're usually looking at the first couple of weeks of April as being kind of the optimum time um, with some leeway in there. The second window is in late summer, kind of centered around September 1st. If you plant in the spring, you tend to have more moisture but you also have more weed pressure. If you plant in late summer, you have very little weed pressure at that time, but you tend to have a bigger chance of hot, dry weather affecting your seedlings. So um, whether you prefer to plant in spring or fall depends a lot on your individual situation. Your weed pressure, your rainfall, you have irrigation, what is your crop rotation? Do you have an open window at either of those times? And then, of course, what's your climate? Obviously, uh, something that I'm going to recommend for eastern Wyoming is not going to be the same as what it is for southwest Texas or Louisiana or the Corn Belt. They're all going to be completely different. So we need to know what your climate and uh, what's your grazing management. Are you rotationally grazing? or are you continuous grazing? If you're rotational grazing, that opens up the possibility of a lot more productive species. A lot of good grazing species just do not tolerate continuous grazing. And really we need to, need to uh, be a little sharper on our grazing management if we really want to optimize uh, some of these species at, at their best value. And then what livestock species? are you using? Um, 
there are some plants that are perfectly acceptable to cattle that are toxic to horses. Um, there are some things that sheep and goats will eat that cattle do not, you know, it's important to know what species are going to be out there. And then also quite importantly, what is your soil? Is it sandy? Is it well-drained? What's the pH? The soil pH is really an important aspect. Uh, we don't need, really need to know nutrient levels uh, in most cases, but we need to know the pH. And we need to know whether it's sandy or, or clay, and we need to know um, how well drained it is. Does it hold water? Uh, is it excessively drained? Um, and, or does it stand water? And then uh, some of the timing uh, depends on whether you are drilling or broadcasting seed, especially in inner seeding. Um, if you broadcast seed, that works best in the middle of winter because freezing and thawing can incorporate that seed and get you seed soil contact. If you are not in, in if you're doing the April or August timeframe, um, you're better off drilling because you're really not during the time of freezing and thawing. Some species broadcast well, others don't. Most of the clovers, uh, chicory, plantain, broadcast very well. Alfalfa, not so much. Most grasses don't broadcast well. Um, an exception to that would be the ryegrasses. And I know people that broadcast annual ryegrass into their pastures um, every winter um, and have good success with that. Um, another um, consideration is how complex do you want the mi mixture? And the idea, what I was taught in college is that the reason you plant a single species is because it's easier to manage. I would disagree. I think it's, it's simpler to manage if you're willing to write checks for fertilizer and herbicide. Nature does not like monocultures. If you fail to plant diversity, nature will provide diversity for you in the form of weeds. And so because there are unfilled ecological niches out there, there there's resources to exploit that you're not exploiting. So I much prefer the situation on the left versus the situation on the right. I want every ecological niche filled with something that I put there. And, and I, I don't want weeds. And if you put a nice complex mixture out there with all the different ecological niches filled and grasses and legumes and forbs, you really don't have weed problems. And you don't usually need to fertilize. And, and so uh, to me, a complex mixture is easier to manage than a monoculture. You don't have to spray. You don't have to fertilize. You can eliminate those inputs. Now, um, as far as what to plant, and maybe we start with what not to plant. And uh, there, there's no such thing as a bad grass, but there, there are grasses that are are not as well suited as others. And this is a picture of Kentucky 31 fescue. And the Kentucky 31 fescue is the most widely planted grass in the United States still. 1931 genetics, um, number one planted grass in the US. And it is probably the single worst choice for pasture that I can imagine, uh, if you're actually going to plant a pasture grass. Now, um, the reason Fescue is, is one of the best grasses there is. It will do something that virtually no other grass will do, and that is keep its quality well into the winter. Um, fescue can be 16% protein and 65% digestibility in the dead of winter. No other grass does that. I mean, fescue has some really unique qualities that no other grass shares which makes it very popular. The problem is not, the problem with fescue is not the fescue itself. This is a, a microscope photo, uh, scanning electron microscope photo of the endophyte fungus within a fescue plant. Um, it's this fungus that, that lives within the leaf that causes the plant to produce toxins. Now, the same toxins and the same process 
actually make the plant heat and drought tolerant, which is what made Kentucky 31 fescue so popular. It was tough. Um, but it also made it mildly toxic to the, to the animals. You can see from this, look at the difference in animal performance between the toxic endophyte and these uh, either endophyte free or novel endophyte fescues. Um, you can see that the animal performance was two or three times better where you did not have the endophyte. Now, the problem is, is when they took the, the endophyte free fescue, just didn't live, it didn't survive. It didn't have the toughness that the endophyte fescue had. So we went through the endophyte free phase and found out that grass died. So they went back to the drawing board and now we have novel endophyte or friendly endophyte fescue now. And it, uh, it's, those are really, really good products. I mean, the Estancia fescue that we carry now, phenomenal product. It combines the toughness. In fact, I think, I think it's a little tougher than K31, um, but you get the good animal performance of endophyte free. Um, it's really the best of both worlds. If you're looking for a pasture for dedicated winter use, I would start with a novel endophyte fescue. It really is the best grass for that purpose. Um, now, if you have endophyte fescue, you say, oh gosh, I've got a problem. What do I do about it? Well, a couple, couple of options. You can either kill it and replace it, or you can deal with it. And, and we'll talk about each of those. How do you kill it and replace it? Now, I have a lot of people say, well, I, I killed my fescue and replanted, and it, it just became toxic fescue all over again. It's a waste of money. And I say, well, how did you do it? They say, well, I sprayed it and planted new fescue. And, and I said, wrong. That's not the way you do it. Because what you did, you might have planted, you killed the fescue that was there, you planted new fescue, and just a few months earlier, the, the toxic fescue that you had put 400 pounds of seed and acre out there, and you planted 20 of the new stuff. Did you really expect success? If you want to replace toxic fescue, you kill that stand and then you plant annual pastures for two years. People say, well, I, I can't afford to be without pasture for two years. You're not. You're not without pasture because what you do after you kill that pasture, and there's, there's magic, I'm going to back up a little bit here, there's magic in the two years. Fescue seed has a maximum longevity of two years. If you are fescue free, if you are free of fescue plants, you kill all the new seedlings for two years, the seed will lose its viability. And the endophyte lasts really about a year at maximum. So not only will virtually no fescue come up, if by chance one does come up, it'll be endophyte free. So in the meantime, what you do when you spray that fescue out, you go in and immediately plant annual pastures. You graze those annual pastures. Now this is in the middle of summer. During the heat of summer, we have a summer annual mix here. You look at a fescue pasture in the middle of summer and it's brown and crispy. It's a cool season grass. It just does not grow well in the summer. People say, well, I can't be without pasture. Well, don't, don't kill your entire pasture, start with 10, 15, 20% of your pasture, spray it out, plant this, and your productivity will go up. This, this is not, the conversion process does not have to be a financial sacrifice. It works just great and it increases your production year one. It's not just a long-term project. Your productivity goes up in year one. And, and it is amazing how much that, that can do for your profitability um, just right away. The other thing, you can dilute it. Anything you put in there that's not endophyte fescue is going to help you out. Whether that's you know, crabgrass or you know, whatever you put out there, clover, anything you put out there that's not infected fescue. And you can either put in different forages or you can haul them feed. If you are feeding hay, try not to feed infected fescue hay on infected fescue pasture or feed them grain. 
anything to dilute that down. And then there are ways to neutralize it. Now there's, you, you know, I've got a picture of kelp in here. There are some animal genetics like uh, Cinepole, it's pretty famous for not being affected by fescue toxin. Um, uh, kelp meal or uh, Tasco or pepper extract cinnamon. Those are all feed additives that you can put in mineral that reduce fescue. But my favorite way is by putting in plants that contain tannins. Tannins, uh, the, the toxic factor in fescue is an alkaloid. And alkaloids are complexed in the rumen by tannins or saponins. Saponins are found in clover and alfalfa, but the most effective neutralization comes from tannins. And some high tannin plants would be things like sanfoin, which is the, the pretty plant that's pictured there. Um, Korean lespedeza is high in tannins. Um, bird's foot trefoil, chicory, and burnet are all high tannin plants or have tannin-like substances. So those are really your best fescue neutralizing plants. And when we go to intercede into toxic fescue, I think those plants should be fairly significant tr contributors to that mix. Another grass that I'm not a big, huge fan of, at least in this area, is Timothy. It seems like anybody with horses wants Timothy. Um, it, it's really a very poor grazing grass for this area. It, it lacks heat tolerance, lacks drought tolerance, and doesn't tolerate grazing very well. Um, it does well in the Northeast United States, does not do well out here in the, uh, in the Plains states at all. I'd leave it, completely leave it out. Kentucky bluegrass is another one, just lacks the heat and drought tolerance that we really need. Um, it does tolerate horse grazing very well among cool season grasses. So if it's a horse pasture um, that tends to get grazed closely, I might throw a pound of bluegrass in the mix. It does spread and thicken up over time and fill in, which is, is valuable. It's going to be the, the last grass standing under severe grazing. Now this is a picture, uh, this is a smooth brome pasture uh, during a drought and that big clump of big tall vigorous grass you see right in the middle there, that is reed canary grass. And as you can tell reed canary grass is extremely productive. It's got a massive root system. I've seen studies where it had four to five times the roots per acre that brome grass had. Uh, so it, it just incredible root system that's deep, expansive. It forms a dense sod that'll hold a vehicle up even in standing water. And reed canary grass, its claim to fame is that it can grow in completely saturated soils. Um, so very, very flood tolerant and tolerant of poor drainage, very productive. Um, there's only one thing wrong with it is like endophyte fescue, it contains alkaloids. Now most wild canary grass is very high in alkaloids, makes it bitter and unpalatable. Um, the reed canary grass we sell is a low alkaloid variety, um, makes it much more palatable. And just like the fescue endophyte uh, that produces an alkaloid, the same plants that help neutralize fescue toxicity will neutralize the reed canary grass unpalatability issue. So I uh, never plant canary grass by itself, always put in plants with saponins and, and even more importantly, plants with tannins. Now, one interesting thing about reed canary grass is that when you bale it up, the alkaloids break down over time. So the longer you store that hay, the more palatable it becomes. Smooth brome. Um, smooth brome is basically the state flower of eastern Nebraska. It, 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 is, uh, it is the predominant pasture grass in northeast Kansas and eastern Nebraska. And um, that's both good and bad. It's very palatable grass, but it really only produces for a couple months in the spring and then just disappears the rest of the year. Uh, it's drought tolerant, but it's not drought productive. 
It survives through droughts by simply just hunkering down and doing nothing. Um, it does spread aggressively, which can be a benefit for erosion control. It's also a problem because it kind of chokes out other species. I, I tend to not use a lot of smooth brome. It, I usually, in a cool season grass mix, I'll put in one pound an acre because I want something that's going to spread and fill in when other components disappear. But I think there's better species than brome to base a cool season pasture mix around. And one of those is meadow brome. I, I love meadow brome. I mean, it looks almost exactly like smooth brome, at least from a distance, but the, uh, it's a bunch grass rather than a sod former. And meadow brome uh, retains its palatability much better. It grows better throughout the year. It'll regrow uh, better. It grows better in the fall, keeps its quality into the winter better. And in almost all respects, it's a better pasture grass than smooth brome. The one thing it doesn't do is spread aggressively like smooth brome does. It tends to stay put. That's good sometimes, that's bad sometimes. That's why I put the one pound of smooth brome in a mix with meadow brome to fill in the gaps where you don't get a good stand. Uh, similar to meadow brome is orchard grass. Uh, between the two, um, orchard grass needs a little more moisture. Um, and it loses its quality when it gets mature a little, little more. So I really prefer meadow brome to orchard grass. Uh, orchard grass is a very common component in pastures as you go east. Um, if you're planting orchard grass, I strongly recommend that you stick to newer varieties. The older varieties like Potomac that came out in the 50s, 60s, have no rust resistance and no drought resistance. The new orchard grass varieties are far more successful and go a lot farther west and, and uh, produce better and, and survive longer. Of course, there's, there's a reason for persist having that name. It just lasts longer. Another uh, species that I really like and, and I've come to really enjoy is this uh, intermediate wheatgrass. Uh, very drought tolerant. Uh, this is one of the few grasses that combine extreme drought tolerance with really good palatability and uh, really good productivity. Um, as far as grasses, uh, we know that grasses respond well to nitrogen. We have from left to right these four plots, zero, 100, 200, and 300 pounds of nitrogen. You say, well, Obviously, the two and 300 are the best here. They're dark green, they're productive. So let's just put 200 pounds of nitrogen out there. And, and obviously it works. The more nitrogen you put out there, the, the more grass you get. The problem is you gotta pay for that nitrogen. And if you look at this, um, I apologize for the poor picture quality. I took this many years ago. This is where an alfalfa uh, plot butted up against an orchard grass plot. You can see, that little strip where they overlap, look at how much bigger and more vigorous the orchard grass is. Rather than fertilizer, we can apply, uh, can supply nitrogen with legumes. And the most productive legume, the most commonly planted legume, but seldom pastured legume is alfalfa. And alfalfa is, is really by far the most productive legume. So, so why, don't, why don't we pasture it? It's because well, we're scared we're going to go out in the morning, we're going to see this. We're going to go out and see all of our cattle dead from bloat. Um, and bloat is a very serious risk with alfalfa. So, so why do we do it? Why do we pasture alfalfa when, uh, you know, I tell people alfalfa is the best pasture plant there is except for two problems. It kills your animals and your animals kill it. So why do we bother? Well, if you look at it, the second most productive legume we're going to talk about is red clover. And you look at this, alfalfa just blows red clover away in terms of productivity. Uh, the productivity of alfalfa is just simply unmatched. So how do you deal with the bloat? Um, the, there's several ways, and, and I have an entire paper on controlling bloat and pasturing alfalfa. If you're interested, email me, I'll send you the entire paper. Um, but 
it, it revolves around dilution. You know, get enough grass so the bulk of the diet is grass rather than alfalfa. And also the bloat causing protein in alfalfa, it seems like all problems are solved by tannin containing plants. And bloat is another one of those problems solved by incorporating tannin containing plants into the stand. Your lespedeza, your trefoil, your sandfoil. And we'll talk about some of those plants. Now, um, one thing, not all varieties of alfalfa are the same. As your fall dormancy score gets higher, your productivity goes up. And you can see the difference between a fall dormant three and a fall dormant five here uh, in the fall. Um, we have a fall dormant seven uh, variety that I'm, I'm really excited about. It's also recessed crown. Recessed crown puts the crown below ground where it's not as susceptible to traffic. Um, you, you don't get the, the, the damage to the plant from hoof traffic like other alfalfas. And so uh, I, I'm very excited about its potential. The problem with long fall dormancy scores is there's usually a trade-off in winter hardiness. Usually in Kansas, Nebraska, we'd be looking at uh, a fall dormant four score. And if you get higher than that, you have winter kill. Well, the nice thing about the Aussie alfalfa is that because of that recessed crown, I think you get better winter protection of that crown. Now, the second most uh, popular legume uh, and most productive legume is red clover. And red clover is really easy to establish. It germinates very well broadcast. And so if you're broadcasting into clover or fescue, this is my number one choice. Um, and a lot of people call and they say, uh, hey, um, I seeded clover and I didn't get anything. You know, what's the problem? Well, there could be a number of problems. And I'll go through. It said, one problem is you, you just might be putting your nitrogen on too heavy. Um, if you are putting legumes into a pasture, do not fertilize with nitrogen. You're going to make your grass too competitive and you're going to delay nodulation on the legumes, which makes them a lot less vigorous. So if you need the productivity, if, if you are locked into needing that productivity from that pasture that year, um, the legumes you plant really won't contribute a lot till next year. What I like to do is I like to seed lentils in, uh, drill lentils in, that's early spring. Um, within 60 days, those lentils will make a really nice abundant crop of high protein legume forage that'll give you an immediate boost in productivity and an immediate boost in nitrogen. Um, another problem is that when you apply, you know, monoculture grass is something that we have historically fertilized with nitrogen. And every pound of nitrogen fertilizer, uh, rule of thumb, requires two pounds of limestone to neutralize. So you've put 100 pounds of nitrogen out for 40 years, do the math. You need 8,000 pounds of lime. And all that acidity is concentrated in the top inch of soil. That's where your seedlings are trying to develop. I've seen brome fields that test pH four. I mean, nothing's going to establish in that. So uh, take a take a pH test right in the surface inch of soil before you you go to renovate a pasture. Um, you might have to spread some lime. And another problem that I've found, and this is this actually is my number one issue with establishing legumes into a sod, is that there's usually just the fields loaded with crickets. Crickets and grasshoppers. Crickets in the spring, both crickets and grasshoppers in the fall. Um, they just annihilate any new seedling that's coming up. Easiest way to see if you have crickets, take a handful of any grain product, whether it's cracked corn or breakfast cereal or bread, get it wet, put it on the ground, put a board over it, come back a day later and see if there's crickets under it. Um, if you have crickets, um, one thing you can do to remove the cricket habitat is to just burn your field off. I've seen side by side uh, fields that have been burned off prior to seeding and com complete beautiful stands of clover and right to the line where they didn't burn, zero. And it's because of cricket predation. 
Um, another thing you can do, of course, is use insecticides. My preference is to spread a bait, a brand-based cricket bait, that uh, like a nolo or semispore bait that contains a protozoan parasite of crickets that kills them, doesn't affect beneficial predators. Another thing you should do is rotationally graze. Your tall growing legumes like alfalfa and red clover absolutely need to be rotationally grazed. The only legume that really does well with continuous grazing is white clover. And, and it's going to disappear as soon as you come to your first drought. And uh, it, it grows when it's moist and, and just dries up and disappears when it's not. So to reiterate here, don't apply nitrogen in the year you seed legumes. You shouldn't have to apply afterwards either. Manage your pH, manage your grazing, manage crickets and grasshoppers, and I will address this later in more depth, inoculate with mycorrhizal fungi. I, th I think that anytime you're starting a new pasture, get the mycorrhizae out there. White clover. Uh, white clover, I I've talked about a little bit. It is very nutritious and it spreads aggressively and it's very tolerant of grazing, even overgrazing. Problem is it's shallow rooted, which makes it drought susceptible and it's not very productive. So it's not a good standalone, um, but there are not all white clovers are created equal. Um, I would, if I'm seeding white clover, I would look at um, some of the newer genetics that are gonna be a lot more drought tolerant. These two flats, uh, we're in a greenhouse, I'm subjected to water deprivation. You can see everlasting uh, clover to the left, much more drought tolerant than regular white clover. Uh, everlasting is a hybrid between cura and white clover, much deeper rooted, much more productive, much more aggressive. Um, so I would either use an everlasting clover, or if you're farther south, I'd, I'd seriously look at stamina white clover. Um, much more heat and drought tolerant than the old standard like Dutch white clover or Ladino clover. Sanfoin uh, gets a lot of, lot of press. It is non-bloating, extremely palatable. As it's one of those tannin containing plants that I like. Has these pretty pink flowers, honeybees love it, wild pollinators love it. Uh, it's pretty to have it out in your pasture. Um, Sanfoin, every, every few years, there's a magazine article comes out, everybody gets excited. Um, they plant Sanfoin and three years later it disappears. Um, for some reason, it seems like the worse the soil is, the more Sanfoin likes it. I planted Sanfoin on my farm uh, several times throughout the years. The best stand I ever got of Sanfoin is when the, I accidentally hit my hydraulic lever and dropped my drill in the gravel road. And I still have sandfoin in that road to this day, but it's disappeared from my pastures. Um, it, it is a very good plant. It tends not to be very long lived in more humid areas. And out in the Western, in the Rocky Mountain areas, um, it seems to persist for years and years. Um, Korean Lespedeza, this is kind of a unique little legume. It's actually not a perennial, it's an annual, but it recedes really well. Um, it is non-bloating, another one of those high tannin plants, um, and uh, it really, it's not very productive, but all of its production comes in July and August, when most legumes are not productive, so it's really good in a mix. And uh, one other neat characteristic that it has is it's tolerant to 2,4-D. A lot of people don't put legumes in a pasture because, well, they feel they've got a they've got to spray weeds. If you're one of those people that think you need to spray weeds, um, Korean Lespedeza might be a good legume to put in a pasture that you're spraying with 2,4-D because it can handle it. Now, don't think that legumes are the only way to get nitrogen in your pasture. This is azospirillum. Um, this is a nit free living nitrogen fixing bacteria. Uh, we have an inoculant called Biazo that contains azospirillum and azotobacter. They'll actually fix a little bit of nitrogen on the roots of grasses. In a pasture situation, grass legume mix, I think Biazo, we've seen really good positive results from it. And I, I think it's something that we're going to increasingly use and recommend over time. 
Um, chicory, this is not a legume, this is a forb. Chicory is a member of the sunflower family. It looks like a big, huge dandelion. And this stuff is candy. It is high in minerals. It's uh, very productive, extremely deep roots, palatable, uh, high protein, high digestibility. Uh, the copper, the zinc, and the phosphorus levels are extremely high, two or three times what grasses are. Um, and it contains uh, some polyphenols that act like tannins. They, they neutralize the alkaloids and the, the, bl the bloat-causing proteins and, and alfalfa clovers. And they're also very good at getting rid of internal parasites. Uh, they're dewormer, natural dewormer. Uh, another forb that I really like is plantain. Uh, plantain, also very high in minerals. Uh, it will grow in the most compact soil you've ever seen. Um, and it contains a, a natural antibiotic that has a couple of functions. Well, like you'd expect out of an antibiotic, it, it helps cure infections, bacterial infections. Um, but also in the rumen, it acts a lot like um, rumensin or Bovitec. It's an ionophore. It actually improves the rumen fermentation, makes it more efficient. Animals belch less methane and, and um, when they belch methane, that's an energy loss. They retain that energy in the rumen and they'll produce about 10% faster. It, it's really a neat plant that I think we need to be using more of. I try to put plantain in every pasture mix, every perennial pasture mix. Another one, this is small burnet. And small burnet is another one of those tannin containing plants. And I told you at the first, there's no grass that will be green and productive year round. There is a forb that is green year round and good any time of the year. And that's small burnet. This stuff will be green in the middle of winter. It'll be green in the middle of summer. Um, very deep rooted. Um, this has a, a good reputation among people who are pasture based dairy producers because it really increases the butter fat content of milk, which is important whether you're a dairy producer or you know producing meat uh, from suckling calves or lambs. And this uh, uh, helps neutralize bloat. It's got some really nice attributes. Another one of those that I think really ought to be in every pasture mix. We're not going to talk a lot today about warm season grasses. Uh, this is a, a uh, that's another webinar. It's a whole topic in and of itself. Um, but I did want to show you this. Um, and, and that previous picture was actually this same pasture, Eastern Gamma grass pasture that I established. And what I wanted to show you was this, you see the line going right down the center. Um, that to the left of that line was inoculated with mycorrhizal fungi. To the right was not. Look at the difference it made. This is why I recommend, I don't recommend mycorrhizal fungi just so I can sell a, a mycorrhizal fungi inoculant to you. I recommend it to you because it works. It really does increase the rate of pasture development. This is a close up of mycorrhizal fungi. You can see the root with all the, uh, all the little hyphae coming out of it. This helps access water and nutrients and bring it back to the plant. And, and little grass seedlings really don't have much of a root system. They can build this fungal hyphae network much, much faster and explore a lot more soil than they can grow their own roots. This is why I recommend mycorrhizal fungi. It works. Um, and this, this is a research project uh, that was published in the Journal of Range Management. Look at the difference in biomass at 14 weeks. This would be like at the end of the growing season. I mean, you're looking at 30 to 40 times as much growth with mycorrhizal inoculation. I, I think it is that important. Um, so um, I kind of blew through all that. I tried to I like to say I tried to fit 10 pounds of potatoes in a five pound sack here today, but um, if you're interested in more of this pasture stuff, uh, I do have a book out there. Just send me an email if you're interested in obtaining a copy of the book. Um, I, I know some of you people listening already have a copy, so 
um, thank you for that. And uh, I'll turn it over to Noah. Yeah, well, just to kind of highlight that book again, you guys, this was, like he said, kind of a fast approach to this. And there's a wealth of knowledge in this book that he's got. So if that is something you guys are interested in learning more about these pastures, there's a ton of answers in this book. Um, you can email Dale directly to purchase that. And he has also given us permission to give out his email and cell number. If you guys want to get in touch with him, we're going to open it up to questions here. Um, I will give out his, so his email is Dale, that's D-A-L-E at greencoverseed.com. And then his cell number is 785-614-2031. With that, we're going to kind of open this up again to questions. I do have a a couple questions that were emailed to me and want to get to those first. Um, This was from Tucker Griffith said, Dale has a video on YouTube uh, where you mentioned that 30 to 40% biomass of plantain was effective way to mitigate drought effects. So his question is, how do you determine how many pounds per acre of seed do you need to apply on a field of Bermuda grass to hit that threshold? And should that be drilled or broadcast? Okay, Um, that was actually chicory. And um, there was a study done, I believe in New York State by Cornell, uh, that indicated that if you had 30 to 40% of your pasture biomass as chicory, um, the deep tap roots, I, I forget the name, uh, they call it the green pump effect. Um, there's a more scientific term for it, but the green pump effect is basically these deep tap rooted plants bring water up from transpiration through the day because the, the warm air during the day pulls moisture up and into the plant. And then at night, that pole is no longer there. When you hit the dew point, um, that moisture will go back down in the plant and it'll basically collide with the water coming up and then it leaks out of the plant right at the soil surface. And so it it actually irrigates the plants around it. And, and chicory is not the only plant that does that, but it seems to be one of the best and uh, at that green pump effect. So, um, what I, in, into Bermuda grass, I prefer to drill chicory in the fall, uh, right before the, the gamma, or the, uh, the Bermuda grass is going dormant. You know, it really kind of stops growing there about the first of September or so. That's a good time to get that chicory out there. As far as what it takes to get 30, 40% biomass, um, I don't know that there's that 30, 40% is any sort of magic number. I think any amount is going to be helpful. Um, but um, it doesn't take a lot of pounds of chicory to get, to get that effect, you know, somewhere in that two to three pounds. I've, I've heard as high as five, but since seven pounds is a pure seeding rate, so I, I think that two or three pounds is, is more than enough. And, and if you can get some, some uh, plantain, alfalfa and, and the burnet seem to have somewhat of that same effect. And I know alfalfa pairs well with Bermuda grass if you are rotationally grazing. So I, I like to get all these species out there. They're very complimentary. So Brian Bryce, uh, along with that Bermuda pasture is asking, does small burnet survive in Bermuda? Um, I don't have enough track record with it. Uh, the, the chicory, the plantain, and the burnet seem to work just, they, they almost seem to be universal plants. I've seen burnet growing up in the Rocky Mountains. Uh, I know it, it uh, grows well in France and England and in these states. And, and um, I think it's definitely worth looking at. It, it seems to be a very wide area of adaptation. I think it'd be a good addition, yeah. Okay, this one is from uh, Clint. He said, could you please send a shot time on the impact trees could have in our pastures? Many of my pastures need more trees for shade alone, but am I missing out on an opportunity to feed my cows as well? Um, this is actually a, a, an area of big interest to me. I think uh, we have 
we have always looked at trees as being the enemy of pasture, and I don't think that's necessarily the case. Uh, I, I think trees can be very complementary. Uh, we've always seen trees as competition to pasture instead of uh, just another forage. Um, there are actually some trees that are nitrogen fixers. Um, black locust is a nitrogen fixer. Um, honey locust, uh, they think, may fix nitrogen. Of course, you don't want the thorny honey locust out there at all. That's, <laughs> that, is a, that is a weed in my book. Um, but um, willows and cottonwoods are actually nitrogen fixing plants. They're, they're not legumes, they don't nodulate, but they fix nitrogen in the green part of the twigs. They're actually nitrogen fixing bacteria in the vascular system of those plants. And willows in particular, uh, of course willow bark was the original source of aspirin, so it's uh, willow foliage is, is a blood thinner. It actually reduces heat stress in late summer, very high in protein. There's been a lot of research that's been done around the world on using willows as a, a cattle, um, especially dairy cattle, uh, because it, it tends to really stimulate milk flow in late summer when the grasses, uh, the pasture grasses are really kind of becoming mature. Um, uh, some some really good research from around the globe. And again, if that's something you're interested in, I can send you some of those research articles if you email me. Uh, Dean Kroll says, I have smooth brome pasture. What would you suggest interceding to with and when? Okay. Um, if you're broadcasting midwinter, um, if you're drilling, uh, now is, is good or, um, you know, late August. Uh, what I like is um, I kind of have what I call a brome, brome and fescue fixing mix. Um, and in the fixing mix is uh, uh, red clover, uh, about five pounds an acre of red clover, uh, a couple pounds of chicory, and a pound each of everlasting clover, um, Korean lespedeza, crabgrass, and plantain. And, and again, if, if you want, want that recipe, I, I should have put it in my presentation. I, I apologize for omitting to put that in there. But again, that's five pounds an acre of red clover, two of chicory, and one pound each of plantain, crabgrass, Red River crabgrass, um, Korean lespedeza, and those two species will recede and thicken up. And uh, what did I miss there? Everlasting clover. If you go farther south, I, I would switch that everlasting to stamina. Okay. Uh, April Barker is in West Central Illinois. And she's okay. planning on establishing a crop field back into pasture this spring by broadcasting. So she's wondering, okay. will rolling the field after broadcast improve my stand or will I be wasting my Absolutely. time? Absolutely. No, it? it should be rolled. You need good seed soil contact. If you broadcast in winter, freezing and thawing will give you that seed to soil contact. The best, the best pasture stand I ever, ever got was from broadcasting onto a shallowly tilled field and then rolled afterwards. Um, I've also got my worst stands that way because it didn't rain for 60 days and the, the wind and the dust blew. Um, No-till stands are definitely more effective uh, are, are more consistent um, than what I've been able to achieve with tillage. Uh, tillage seems to be either a spectacular um, success or a spectacular failure, and a lot of it depends on uh, if you get a gentle rain, it's, it's a home run. If you get a big rain, seed all washes along with your soil. If you don't get any rain, you get no germination. I, I much prefer to no-till if I can. But yes, broadcast following by rolling or, or you know, harrowing to get just a little bit of loose soil and then rolling. Uh, works very well. Uh, Brian Rice again uh, is in Arizona. He says the soil temps are above 65 degrees. So is there anything he can be planting now into Bermuda? Mm. I really 
don't like planning this time of year in Bermuda because Bermuda is just so, so competitive. Um, and that's probably uh, the person who has done more work with interceding into Bermuda than anybody I know is Jim Johnson down at the Noble Research Foundation or Noble Research Institute. Um, he, he has really done more work. Um, I'd have to defer to the, him on that. Almost all my Bermuda grass seeding experience is done in the fall. It's hard to do anything this time of year because Bermuda grass is, is very, very competitive. Things that I've seen that do work, uh, some of your lard, really big seeded summer legumes and broad leaves like uh, cow peas, uh, okra, um, and sun hemp seem to work about as well as anything this time of year. And, you know, it's nice to have a legume or a forb like okra out there to, to provide those components that Bermuda grass is lacking in. Uh, Fernando says, Bursim and Clover Alexandrinum, is there any experience? Um, we do use uh, some of it um, and for different purposes in different areas. Um, some of the the real advantages of bursine clover, uh, it's it's um, an annual, um, at least in in my experience, it works as an annual. Uh, there may be some areas where it's perennial. Um, in the southern U.S., it's a very productive, uh, very palatable, non-bloating legume um, that's used as a winter annual down south. In the northern states, it's used as a summer annual. Um, in the northern areas and also in the Rocky Mountains, um, it's mostly used when alfalfa, a stand of alfalfa uh, winter kills or, or is killed by flood. And we need something that we can thicken that alfalfa. Of course, alfalfa is, most of you know, is autotoxic. You, have an old alfalfa stand that thins out, you cannot successfully put more alfalfa into it. Uh, alfalfa is toxic to its own seedlings. So we need something else to put in there. And bursine clover looks like alfalfa in the field. It dries in the bale like alfalfa, looks like alfalfa in the bale, same feed value. So it's, it's, it's like a temporary rapid establishing alfalfa. Um, hey Dale, I might just yes. jump in and say too, if, if you're doing that, and that, that's a great application of bursine clover, uh, you're going to want to make sure you use the frosty bursine type because it is a multi-cut. Most yes. of the bursines like the Belady uh, are pretty much a single cut and so you can get some of the benefits but you're not going to get the regrowth. So if you're looking to spruce up an alfalfa stand or do a multiple grazing type situation, uh, you want the frosty and it's also much more cold tolerant so you can go out earlier in the spring with yes. it than you could with the lady type as well yeah and um i i've been disappointed with using the blady um in in that role and originally i thought maybe the blady would be a little better than the frosty because we're growing it in the summer but um I, i've been more impressed with the with the frosty and uh, seems seems to work over a, a wider range of conditions. Thank you. Okay, uh, this will be the last question here before we wrap up from Mike McDonald. How do you best gauge the nutrient needs to fertilize your paddocks? You utilize much of your suggested grasses, forbs, and legumes after the first year of establishment. Okay. Um, th th this is obviously a matter of controversy because you know, the, there's a lot of people who say, you know, don't fertilize, you don't ever need to fertilize. Um, and if you have the right microbial population, you got your soil in shape, um, really you should be able to, I guess, coast uh, because the vast majority of your fertility cycles back from your pasture foliage, taken into the, the, the animal and defecated back out you know, 85, 90% of your phosphorus and potassium should go right back on to your field in the form of manure and urine. Uh, your nitrogen, you will have nitrogen losses from the system, but if you have good legume percentage 
and, and possibly some free living nitrogen fixers, your nitrogen supply should get better and better every year. Um, and a lot of that depends on how you manage your grazing. Um, if you are continuous grazing, the animals have access to the whole pasture, you will see a migration of your fertility towards your water source, towards shade. Animals go and they bed down in the shade and they'll lay down. And then when they stand up, the first thing they do, you know, there goes your fertility in the shade where nothing grows. So um, a, a good rotational grazing system where you are ensuring that animal distribution is uniform over the pasture will reduce your fertility needs. And, and one surprising thing is just not grazing your pasture too hard. Uh, make sure you have adequate rest periods. Um, if you uh, maintain good plant vigor through grazing management, you'll have deeper roots that enable the plants to access more fertility and you'll have higher levels of root exudates that nourish free living nitrogen fixers and also microbes that can extract fertility from the soil. Um, so you, uh, I like when I establish a pasture, I want to have my, my pasture be very fertile. I mean, I want to have good levels of mineral fertility when I start out. Um, with the hope that that's the last time I ever have to apply fertilizer to that pasture. And so if I'm starting with the normal degraded cropland soil, when I establish a pasture or, you know, the normal overgrazed pasture with poor root systems, that I think is probably typical all across the country, um, I, I will, be very aggressive about providing for fertilizer to it. And then my hope is that that's the last time I ever have to do that. Get the biology and, and once you get the biology rolling, you should be able to coast from that point on. And mycorrhizal fungi is very important in, in that equation. It, it will enable the plants to access a lot of uh, otherwise bound up fertility sources. Well, with that, uh, we're going to wrap things up here. Dale, I uh, really appreciate your time. Uh, again, if you guys have any questions that didn't get answered, you can feel free to email him. That's dale, D-A-L-E, at greencoverseed.com. And his number is 785-614-2031. Thank you guys for tuning in. Next week, we are going to have Thanks, Trent everybody. and Armin Miller on to talk about biological products. Um, so some humates and things like that. Um, Dale, appreciate it. Keith, thanks for tuning in and thank you all for being with us this evening. Thanks everybody. Have a good week.